leading us in worship. Today, that last song is going to apply so directly to the text and, I believe, to people's lives sitting in the room that the enemy thought he had me. Man, so many times, right, we have made some decisions where the enemy should rightfully think that he has us exactly where he wants us, and yet God has the ability to turn wrong turns into right places, and that'll be our subject matter as we talk about the chance to change. Every message as we started the year have given insights to changes that can be made when God's Word is applied, and, and today we're going to be talking specifically about generational change, and that has kind of a two-prong two uh, part, and that number one is uh, we are always looking for the next generation of young people, right? We've said it many times, the number one budget item in our church will always be investing in the next generation because the church is always one generation away from extinction. So if we do not reach the next group of people, the next young people that are walking, are going through life, then all of a sudden you become, and what most churches do is as they grow older, they grow inward. And now it's about like, you know, how how can we make this like a country club? Like how can we make it better for us and add amenities and maybe there's a pool outside or whatever, I don't know. But um, it's not about that, you know, it can't be about that. It's not only about reaching the next generation and doing whatever it takes to save souls, it's also about the next generation of unbelievers, right? That there's a next generation, there's a next group of marriages that need to be saved. There's a next group of people that have been far from God all their lives that need to hear the gospel of Jesus. There's the next generation of people who are going to serve and lead in this church, and they're constantly walking through the doors. And so if it's ever just about the people of the past, then we're going to neglect what God is doing right now. I don't get to decide what the church is about. Understand Jesus, Jesus defines his church. And it's really odd because I think some people want to say things, and I don't think that they mean it, but like, you know, sometimes we're just saying things without thinking. They're like, oh, I want a church that's X. Or I want a church that does X. I want a church that does X. <laughs> and like, you know, I think that there's plenty of variety of churches, but there's some staples that can't be compromised because if Jesus has defined it, then I can't add to that definition, right? And so when Jesus says, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, right? That's what he said. He said he came from heaven to earth to seek and to save that which was lost. So how can we be about something other? We can't make anything greater than seeking to save that which was lost. Paul the apostle said, I have done everything. I spent all my means that by all possible means I might save as many as possible. And so Paul reiterates the message of Jesus. On the shores, um, whenever Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven, he gives his great commission. And what did he say? He said, go out there as the church empowered through local churches all over the world and reach people with the gospel and baptize them in my name and then teach them what I taught you. And so that's what the church is. So you can make it about other things, but it's not about something more than reaching lost souls, saving them, and then teaching them how to live life change through God's Word. So today I hope that I can help through a story in the Old Testament, share with you how that you can plan your family and accomplish generational change. Because generational change is very, very difficult, very unusual, very uncommon. To get to pass on your faith to your children and then them pass on that faith to the next. I did a little study of this and uh, all the kings of the Old Testament, all of them, there's only two out of the some 30 to 40 kings, only two that the father passed on a faith that the son followed as he became king. Wow, right? You'd think that when you get all the way to the top, it should be easier, right? Any of you, like you've made it, you made it up there to that upper level? Did it get, like, is that perception you had true? <laughs> more people, more, yeah, more power? More problems, I'm telling you. Be careful what you ask for. You're like, if I was the boss someday, fool, you don't even know. You don't even know what you're asking. If I own my own company, you don't even know if you've never done it. Don't even come up here and talk to me with that weak trash. Anyway, mm, 
I'm sorry. I was just getting on a tangent there. So as we're thinking about this morning's message and we're trying to reach that next generation, I'm sure that every parent in here, you want to pass on your faith, right? You want to pass it on. And so how are you going to do that? Today I'm going to give you some simple steps that Jacob had to follow in order to be awakened and become aware. And so I'm going to pass those on to you at the end of the message. I'm going to set up the first part about how Jacob kind of got to where he was at. And that's going to be the wrong turns that all of us have taken. Just by show of hands, how many people in here has ever taken a wrong turn? Anybody? By show of hands? Okay. Yeah, sure. And we can even like extrapolate that a little further. I mean, have you ever taken a wrong turn in a relationship? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you exited the freeway before you said I do. Um, anyway, but you have wrong terms in, in jobs. You know, have you ever taken a job and like instant, instant, almost instant, like, oh man, what have I done? What have I gotten myself into? Sometimes it's not even a job, it's a promotion. And you thought more money, oh yeah, it must be God's will. No, no, not always. Sometimes it's, it's a trap. Sometimes it's a temptation that's thrown out before you. And so sometimes it's even churches. Sometimes you can feel like, man, you know, am I in the right place, wrong place? I've, I've, I've entered into a church and maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right. I hope that I can help add to that discussion today. I can tell you a story real quick to start us off, a little appetizer. Um, one time I made a wrong turn and it's one of the more embarrassing moments of my life. And um, I was out fishing with a buddy, his name is Kurt. And um, uh, Kurt, has, we've been hanging around for a while now, and uh, we went out fishing this week, and it reminded me, we started retelling that story as we were in the car, and I said, you know, I've never told that story on a Sunday because, like, uh, it's traumatizing, it's traumatizing, <laughs> traumatizing. And Kurt has a thing, it's like, I'm not going to say he's bad luck, but bad things happen when Kurt goes with me fishing. And so, you know, I'm just saying, there is a, a, a plethora of data points. Anyway. And so on this particular day, we were going out to Lake Nakona, and it's out northeast, northwest. And so um, we had to go through Denton. And apparently, there's a place that is one of their favorite hot spots when they were young marrieds, and it's called Double Dave's Pizza. We used to have one here in Frisco, and, you know, it's not in business any longer. Anyway, I'm just telling you, maybe not the greatest, but any, whatever. He was raving, raving on the way out, six o'clock in the morning probably, you know, like, oh, there's double days. We ought to stop on the way home. I was like, Kurt, I don't want to stop at double days. I don't care about double. It's like a CC's, all right? You know, it's not, it's not like, oh, gourmet pizza. Any, no. And so, so we were on our way out and we got up there, we fished. And it wasn't a great day. We got rained on, we got stormed off the lake. So we were coming off and and it's an hour and a half before you get to Denton. Uh, and by the way, you know, Denton, all right? Anyway, so, so we're, 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 we're approaching Denton, and he's like, hey, you know, I texted Bernita, and she'd really love to have some Double Day's pizza if you could just stop in there. And I was like, okay, tell you what, I'll compromise because I'm not a tyrant, but I am one of those people like, I don't like to stop. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm like to get in the car and go. And if you didn't use the bathroom and you have boys, it's like, here's a bottle. You know what I'm saying? And so here, we're like on our way home and it's already been a bad day. So I just want to get home. And so I was like, okay, you call it in right now so that when we get there, it's ready. We're not going to be sitting around because the storm was moving the direction that we were stopping. So it already hit us. And if we stop long enough, it will hit us again. Anyway, Kurt just wants double days. And so we pull up down a side street, and it's like right there on this corner of the side street, and he pops out, runs in there. I'm like, okay, I'll just make the block because I'm blocking traffic with the boat. And so it's a bass boat, not a yacht or anything like that, just a little bass boat. And so went up the street, took a right, made the block, turned a right, and then there was the north entrance, or I guess it would be the east entrance, into the parking lot. Well, here's where it's going to get interesting, okay? Okay. Um, the east entrance was like a blind turn down a hill. And when I say a hill, I'm saying like a 45 degree incline. I'm saying like a North Texas University engineer student <laughs> on weed made this parking lot is what, and that's not far from possible. Would you say amen? Okay, anyway, anyway, I. I turned and then the nose of the truck dove, all right? And I'm, I'm in a, like a moment, like I've, never, I've never been in this situation before. I'm a boat owner for like seven years at this point. I've never been in this situation before. And I'm like, well, I mean, you know, well, well, you know, 
I think it'll be all right. And so I started easing, easing down that hill. Well, if you've ever pulled a trailer, there's like an incline versus load capacity versus height of the trailer. There's a thing, there's an equation, and I don't know it, okay? I willingly profess, I do not know it. I got to the bottom of the hill, my truck got level, but my trailer was still on an incline, and the frame of the trailer sat down <laughs> on the concrete, and it made a noise. And like this, like if anybody played that noise right now, I could tell you exactly what that noise is. I'll never forget that noise. It's like, <laughs> and then I stuck. Now I can't move. And in my mind, rage, rage, rage. At who? Kurt North. Why? Double days. Got to have double days. Double days. Double days. And really, if you want to take it out to its logic extent, Bernita. Bernita. Oh, Bernita. Bernita loves double days. And in my mind, I have this ability. In my mind, I don't know if anybody else is good at this. I have the ability to take my wrong turn and instantly turn it into someone else's fault. I am a good blamer of my wrong turns and my stupidity. Anyone else? Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Like, I didn't even have to think about it. In my mind, I was, is it Kurt North? red eyes and then who comes bebopping out without pizza mind you Kurt here he comes <laughs> and he's looking across this parking lot it's like a hundred yards like he's like what what are you doing what's I was like shut up Kurt just go get the pizza and now I gotta commit I gotta commit I put it in reverse put it in reverse and I gotta now back the grind up into the oncoming traffic that I can't see because it's 15 foot above where I'm at. And I'm like, at this point, I don't care. I'm ramming the gate. Anyway, throw it in reverse. And like, it's making a noise. I'm talking squealing tire. And I'm like, boom, back it out. And like, my heart rate is at a thousand. And Kurt gets in with his pizza. He's like, oh, thanks for stopping at Double Down. I was like, I say, Kurt, I'm going to be angry for about an hour, and I'm going to blame you. It has nothing to do with you. It's my fault, but I want you to know for the next hour, in my mind, it's your fault. <laughs> and that is where we'll start this morning's message. Mm -hmm. Some of you, you've made wrong turns, and you committed. You committed to the wrong turn, and now you're stuck. And you're going to have this real tendency, especially in today's culture, to blame someone. Blame your parents, blame somebody, blame a church, blame a boss, blame an economy, blame a president. Whatever you want to do, you'll find them, and you'll do it with ease. You'll, it's not your fault. You have no accountability in your equation. So I just hope today... As you might embrace, you know, that if you've made some wrong turns and find yourself in a place that you never wanted to be in, whether it's relationally, spiritually, in love, dating, marriage, work, that there is a way to get out. There is a way to course correct. You just have to follow what God's Word says. Fair enough? You guys ready? All right. I feel like I set the table pretty good there. You know what I'm saying? Genesis 28, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Contextually, you just need to know that he stole his brother's birthright and he stole the blessing. The birthright entitled him to the majority share of the property. The blessing was a, a, a God thing where an Abrahamic blessing was passed to Isaac and then that was passed on to Jacob. And once he gave it to Jacob, it couldn't be rescinded. And so he had stolen two things from his brother. And this is Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, if you did something like that, they could just kill you. And so um, Esau was that guy. Um, and he was wanting to take um, Jacob out to the river and baptize him until the bubbles stopped. And so um, Jacob was the uh, fairer of the two. And um, his mom said, you need, you, you need to get out of town. You need to run. And so that's, that's how he got to this place, okay? So he has made terrible decision after terrible decision that has landed him. And I just want to tell you, you can, you can get away with it for a little while, but keep making selfish, self-centered decisions. And eventually, it will cost you the relationships that you love the most. 
Fair enough? And the church said, amen. amen. She has a solemn amen. Okay. <laughs> and he came to a certain place. And I like it. You need to take note of that. Just underline it in your Bible. A certain place. Because um, it's not named. Because it's just, you know, you're on your way. It's like Denton. It's like, it's not even a real thing. It's just <laughs> some place you go through. He's at a certain place. And he stayed there that night because the sun had set. Mm. And I, I don't, I'm not even going to preach all the sermons in this. But man, you're going to get to a place where it's night. And it's no longer day, and the sun has set. And you know exactly what that feeling is like, right? It's like, well, I've gone as far as I can go in this wrong decision for the day, and now I'm going to go to sleep. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down on the place to sleep. Now, you know that you have made some bad life decisions if you are using a stone as a pillow. Correct. Anybody? Like, you didn't set out and go like, well, it was going to be a feather or like a foam, but no, I chose rock uh, to sleep on. That's, that's not a real choice, okay? So some bad things are happening, and he's very uncomfortable in his wrong decision. But he has not come to that realization yet. Just like most of us, we're just going to stay stuck, keep trying to push the gas and go farther into the wrong turn. Everyone is looking at you, and you look like a fool. I know how that feels. How could this man lead a church into the promised land? He looks so dumb. Anyway, um, and he dreamed, it says, verse 12, and behold, there was a ladder. We call this Jacob's ladder. And it was set up on the earth, and the top of it reached heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Things were going up, and things were going down. So I wanted to ask this question, um, existential question. How did he get there for us how did you get here, right? How did you get here? Have you ever, have you ever like tried to introspect and like kind of stop and think like, how, how did you get here? How did you get here? Like, was it, was it through luck? Was it through circumstance? You know, because like I think we arrive at places, as I did, and we commit to these wrong turns, and then a lot of times these wrong turns they have emotions that are attached to them. So if you think about it, if things have not gone your way, you could really easily give in to like an anger, right? And, and as you're sitting here this morning, I just want you to start contemplating, deconstruct, what, how did you arrive at this level of anger that you live at every single day? If, if, it's, if it's a problem with anxiety or frustration, you live in perpetual frustration. You never have peace, only frustration. How did you get here exactly? If you're not happy in your marriage, like how did you get here? If you're not happy with how your children are behaving, how did you get here? If you don't like your job, then how did you get here? If you don't like your church, then how did you, like, have you ever thought about the how statements? Because a lot of times we have to like look inside and say to ourselves, what behaviors, what beliefs, what emotions are driving me towards this place? And I'm sure that Jacob had some time to reflect out in the middle of the desert by yourself, laying on a rock, right? And knowing that your brother's out there somewhere, and if he finds you, it's over, right? Man, a lot of time for self-reflection. I think that, that whenever we're asking ourselves those hard questions, it allows us to peel back the layers of the onion and try to figure out what, what makes us make the decisions that we make. And then hopefully we can put them through a filter of God's will, God's way. And then we have to ask ourselves, are we at where we're at? because of our will or we are at where we're at in the middle of the desert? Is it our will or God's will that led us there? Because you can't hold on to anger and your heart be full of love. You can't hang on to bitterness, right? If your heart's full of forgiveness. You can't be constantly mean <laughs> and your heart be filled with grace and mercy and kindness, right? So how did you get, how'd you get there? 
Did you start making some wrong turns? Give in. Allow those emotions to take over. Now those emotions drive you. Has nothing to do with God. Has everything to do with what we commit to. Jacob made wrong decisions. And now he's at a wrong place. Isolated and alone. It's cost him his family. It's all on the verge of costing him his future. All because he's doing it his way and not God's way. I promise you, wherever you're at, wherever you're at this morning, you made some decisions to get there. I want us to think about this. Have you ever been in a place, a certain place, that is full of uncertainty? In between two chapters. Think about it like that. It's like, you know, the chapter on him living with father and mother and around his brother, that chapter ended now he's getting ready to go live with his uncle and that's going to have its whole new set of fun circumstances Jacob's going to find himself in. And he's in between these two worlds. And sometimes that causes us a little bit of anxiety whenever we're in between the chapters, right? We're like in this place. It's a certain place, but it's full of uncertainty. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going to happen next. Man, if you've ever made some wrong decisions, I promise you, as I was sitting there, my fear was that someone was going to come out with their phone and I was going to be on YouTube and TikTok. And they're like, look at this idiot. Look at him. Look at this guy. He got his, how did he even think that that was even blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, oh, please, Jesus, let me get out of this. I think a lot of times when we make all these wrong turns. We just get ourselves in a place. And now we're thinking, it's like, I got to get out. I got to get out. I got to get out. And I think there's another component that we're going to get into God has to enter into this equation because I think there's a level of stuck that you can't get yourself out of. I think there's a level of depressed that you can't get yourself out of. I think there's a level of sadness and, and aloneness and anger and bitterness and envy. I think there's a place that you can get to that, that you can't, on your own, get yourself out of it. And yet, check this out. I have a second question. He says, do you think he felt blessed while lying there on a rock for a pillow in the middle of nowhere? I would assume that he didn't. I would assume that he felt forsaken. I would assume that he felt like maybe even God didn't care. Here he is out there in the middle of nowhere, all alone, animals making noises. I don't know if they have coyotes over there, but they have things that'll kill you, I assure you. In between two seasons. And because of his wrong decisions, he doesn't feel blessed. He feels alone. And then what happens? He lays down and it says that he has a dream. Now understand something. He has done nothing to deserve this dream. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Like, it wasn't like, oh, he went out into the desert and he had this epiphany. And he's like, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then God gave him a dream. He was in the midst of the wrong turn. And God gives him a dream. Now that should be informative and hopeful to you, right? If you've made some wrong decisions, made some wrong turns, ended up some wrong places, got yourself stuck, does that mean that God has cast you off forever? Or does that mean that God specializes in finding people in dark places? Of course he does. You remember Abraham? Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees. He was a happy farmer, right? Wealthy farmer, successful farmer. And it says that God came looking for Abraham. Abraham was out looking to be the progenitor of the promise that would save the entire world through his seed that would be passed on, that would become Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem. That was not on Abraham's mind as he was out there farming that day. But guess what? God's dream came looking for him. When David was out there as a shepherd boy, young man, he was never thinking, oh, God, one day will make me the greatest king of all time. He was taking care of the sheep. And God's dream via Samuel came looking for him. When Paul in the New Testament, just to show you that this template exists as a thread throughout the entire Bible. It says Paul was on the road to Damascus on his way to persecute Christians and even have them put to death. And he was not looking for Jesus. He was not looking to become the greatest missionary 
that would literally change the face of the earth as a result of his church planting endeavors. He was looking to persecute, not to promote Jesus. And yet Jesus came looking for him. Now, if we stretch this out and make it personal and apply it to our own lives, did you deserve the dream that God has for you? No, none of us deserve the dream that God has for us. How incredible is God that he looks for us even when we are not looking for him? That God first loved you before you ever loved him. And I guarantee you, some of you made a wrong turn and accidentally showed up to Genesis Metro Church today and you were not looking for God. But I promise you this, before the end of this message, you will realize that God was looking for you. I can tell you this, we were not looking, Carrie and I, for Frisco, Texas. We, Frisco, Texas, via God's plan for us, came looking for us. We didn't even know where this place was. This planet, this, this uh, thing that we're building on El Dorado, 3330 El Dorado, by the way, 3330, opens in July. Anyway, I did not go looking for that piece of property. I had a little old lady that had a vision for God, called me up and said, hey, your church is going to be located on this property. I said, thank you for letting me know. That, right? The vision came looking for me. Shouldn't that drive us to a place of gratitude? Shouldn't that gr drive us to a place of humility? That God has a divine dream for your life and you did nothing to deserve it, but he gave it to you anyway and the church said, amen. Yes, yes, yes. We are going to be walking inside a dream in about six months and we're going to see God do even greater things than he has done before, all because you have obeyed and you have pledged and you have given and you have shared and you have served. But make no mistake about it, we didn't deserve it. If God gave us what he deserved, oh, we'd be in bad shape. Here's Jacob out in the middle of the desert having a dream. It says, verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Mm. Mm. Now, if you know the Bible, which I will not make the assumption everyone in here does, there's always three that we say, because these are the three people that God personally made the covenant with, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? But if you are new and this is nuanced, let me, let me let, this is not the sermon, but I'm, you know, I have to, I can't let it go here. Like, it's going to become the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But at this particular conversation, it is the God of Abraham and Isaac. What is my point? You have a choice to make whether or not you're going to agree with God's story. Because right now he's the God of the people that have chosen to agree with his story. But he could be the God of you if you would come into agreement with the story. It could be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Jacob is going to have to decide once he hears the promise, once he hears the arrangement, is he willing to assent, agree, and submit to the plan? So you are only one decision away for becoming part of God's divine dream for your life. And that is for you to accept that God has a story and that he's the author and he is the finisher, he is the alpha, he is the omega, and that you can get to be part of the divine story, the divine dream, what you were created to do and be. All you have to do is agree. All you have, the only thing standing between you in your wrong turn, becoming a right place, is a decision. It says that he was the God of Abraham and Isaac. He said, the land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring. That's crazy. Like, he's on the run in the middle of a desert. And he said, where you, where you randomly, certain place, chose to stop is the place that I'm going to give you and your offspring, an inheritance. Verse 14. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. Do you remember the promise that was given to Abraham? We covered it for many weeks. God said to a barren woman, a barren situation, a dead situation, he spoke life into death, and he said, I'm going to multiply you, Abraham. And then he re repeated the promise to Isaac. He said, I'm going to multiply you, Isaac. And now he's offering the same offer to Jacob that he will multiply him if he will come into agreement. And he said that 
I will spread you abroad to the west, the east, the north, and the south. What? And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And aside, God is trying to get the blessing through Jacob. Do you understand that? See, in this area, we've all been blessed and we have received. But God did not mean to get the blessing simply to you. It was meant to be passed through you so that all of the earth shall be blessed. Think about that. If, if you had enough food in your pantry at home to feed a multitude, number one, you could never consume it all. But if there was someone starving right beside you, wouldn't it be terrible for you to just hoard the blessing of God that he intended for you to use to help someone else? We need to awaken to the fact that God is blessing us to get the blessing not just to us, but through us to wake up that he placed us and he blessed us in the field that we are in so that we could be a blessing to those around us. It says, verse 15, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Man, oh, oh, that's just so, I don't have time to preach at all, folks. I don't have time to preach at all. But like, that God is not going to leave me, so I'm never, I'm never going to be alone. That sometimes you feel like when you've made these wrong turns, that you are all alone. But what if I told you that you are not alone, that that is how you feel about it, but if you pull it back, and we'll learn it in just a moment, that God is there, even in the wrong turns, that God is there. That when you feel like in your marriage you are all alone, you are not alone, you are not alone, God is there. When you feel like you're alone, when you're single, whenever you feel like you're alone and you're parenting and like you can't even talk to other people about it because you're embarrassed Man, that's a lie from the enemy. No, I'm not even getting that. You need to be able to understand you are not alone. Whenever you are feeling like this life is not worth living, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that we have the most blessed generation that has ever walked the face of the planet, ever, ever in the history of ever, and they walk around thinking about taking their life all the time. It can't just be that physical blessing equals life. Isn't there something unique and, and paradoxical in that? That you would think that blessed would equal love of life. But blessed without God, it appears to be a curse that you could have everything at your fingertips and not love life. I'd say that's a curse. Man, I hope we'll see Jacob has this turnaround. It says, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. God can transform wrong turns into right places, but there's a process that you have to go through. So if you're sitting down in the midst of a wrong turn right now, if you're feeling the weight of a wrong turn, if you're feeling isolated as a result of a wrong turn, here it is. Get ready. Get ready. I feel like, honestly, we're going to have to take this up a notch, okay? Like, like, like some of you, you just showed up at church today, okay? We're going to go next level, all right? So I hope you are ready for what I'm getting ready to bring, all right? Because, like, the waiter is getting ready to serve the meal, but I'm not going to put it in your mouth like a baby bird, okay? You're going to get your utensils out, and you're going to have to eat it off the plate, I'm just here to serve it, okay? You understand? Does everybody get that? All right. I hope you're ready. I don't think you're ready. Anyway, first thing that you have to have is an awakening, all right? Awakening. It says that after he had this dream, God was sitting at the top, angels descending, ascending. It says that he said, surely God is in this place. He had an awakening. Not only just he woke up physically, but he had an awakening spiritually. So this morning as you're sitting in here, if you want to get out of the wrong turn and into the right place, then you have to say, I have to wake up, wake up from what I am living in, wake up from the wrong turns that I've taken, and you have to be able to start acknowledging God. So he awakes and he acknowledges. He says, surely 
God was in this place, and I didn't know it. Man, all of a sudden you can see that this acknowledgement is beginning to unlock things in his perception. So I started thinking about people that come to church on a regular basis, and you start saying, oh, man, like, you know, what, what is the difference between a awake person and a non-awake person? Like, he went to, to bed that night, think about this for just a moment, and when he woke up, what had changed, right? What had changed? Everything still looked the same, right? It was, it was still the desert. He was still on a stone. He was still all alone. But all of a sudden now, something changed. He said, surely God was in this place and I didn't know it. Do you think that it's possible that some people sit in here every week and they are just on the run from the wrong turn, laying on a stone in the middle of the desert and God is all around them. God is all around them, yet they feel isolated and alone because they are asleep and not awake. You're mistaking the, de the desert when God is trying to do something divine inside your dream. What would change? What could change the needle this morning for you to wake up and to realize you are not alone, that God is all around you, and you are the container, you are the vessel, that in a moment it could change. You say, God, I acknowledge that you are God. I am not God. It is not my will. It is your will that must be done. And in the moment, in the instant that you surrender the throne, I promise you, your eyes would be open. And now all of a sudden you see things you couldn't see. Nothing changed. And yet everything changed. You'll still be sitting in the same seat. You'll go home in the same car. You'll go home in the same bed, the same house. Nothing will have changed on the outside. But everything will have changed on the inside if you would wake up this morning. Wake up and realize that God's way is better than your way and that he was there all along. Even while you were asleep in the desert feeling all alone, he was around you, pursuing you, chasing you, loving you, forgiving you. And all you have to do is come into acknowledgement. Surely God was here and I didn't even know it. The last part, it says verse 17. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. There's a connection between awake and aware. It's like this place that was a desert, he woke up and it was just a desert. It was just dry. It was just full of death and things that wanted to kill him. And he wakes up and he says at the same place, he says, how awesome, how awesome is this place? Now think about it. He went to bed and he's thinking, ah, oh, Esau's going to kill me. Now I've lost everything. I tried to cheat and steal my way out of the problem. I just made it worse and I'm dumb and I, I'm all alone. And I don't even know what's going to happen. In my, I don't even know where I'm going in my life. This is the way he went to sleep. And then he had a dream, a dream from God, a divine dream. He woke up and he agreed. He said, man, God was here. I didn't even know it. And now he says at the place that he's in that was foreboding. And I think about how many people walk around and this is how they live. This is how, tell me if I'm wrong. Now this is where I have the archer's arrow out and I'm going to come for you. All right. Even if you're sitting in the back. All right. Casey, I see your shirt. All right. You ready? All right. Okay. He did the chop, by the way. I think they're going to get chopped down today. That's what I say. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have said that after the offering. Anyway. <laughs> so here he is. And he wakes up and he says, how awesome is this place? And I started thinking about how people live. And I think on the, on the other side, while he was still asleep, this is the way he lives. And this is the way I think a lot of people live. They wake up and it's like this morose attitude. And that's a, not a word people use all the time, but let me demonstrate it and you tell me if I'm right, Okay. You wake up, you're like, ugh, I gotta go to work today. Ugh, I gotta look at them today. Oh, I gotta have sex with them again. Oh, I gotta parent these people. 
Oh, I got another soccer game, a football game, and a dance recital, and a karate practice. Oh, I got to go to work, and I got to see these people. Oh, I got to leave these people. Your spouse is like, oh, let's go to church. And the kids are like, oh. And the husband's like, oh, do we have to go? We can just watch it online. It's the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. That's for the people. Man, do you think living like that, that if you feel like that every day, do you think that's God's best for your life? Is that the divine dream? Is that the God that will never leave you nor forsake you? Is that the God that says, I will fulfill every promise that I gave you if you just come into agreement and acknowledge that I'm the God that can turn the wrong turns into the right place if you just trust me? Think about that for a moment. Is it the place that needs to change? Because I think that's where we start going, right? That's where we start. It's like, just like me out there with Kurt. Like, I got to blame something. And we start saying to ourselves, oh, I need to change the job. I need to change the marriage. I need to change the kids. Get them out of here. And then all of a sudden, I'll be happy. I need to change over. And I need to go to another church because this church, is it doesn't have the thing. And, like, people talk about church is so weird. I just want you to know that we're going to go church shopping. Like, what are you shopping for? What do you, like, what do you think? Like, you get like that, oh, we're going to put you in the 401K for this church. Anyway, like, what, what are you talking about? I saw a guy this week. He's like not a pastor, but he's selling community. And then for like for $10, you can have connection, you can hear sermons, you can have Bible studies, and you'll have face-to-face -face interactions virtually for $10 a month. I'm like, that's the church, fool. We do it for free. We do it for free. You're going to charge people to have virtual church, and he's got a hundred, almost a million people that are following that. You understand what I'm saying? Let's substitute out and charge people and start selling it like a business. Come on. Church is not a place that you come to take. It's a place you come to give. It's not about you, Goldilocks, trying to find a church that's just right. No. You find a church that's just right, you need to leave because you'll mess it up. <laughs> I'm not even done. I'm not even done. It's not the desert that needed to change. The place didn't need to change. You know what needed to change? The person. The person. You could be sitting in the same place and if you awake and acknowledge that he's the God who sits on the throne above, who spoke you into existence, who created you from your mother's womb and has a divine destiny for your life, I promise you, you would awake and realize that God's hand has been there all along. And you would take the most mundane thing, the most mundane, like you say, I hate this house. I hate this thing. I hate this weather. I hate this husband. I hate, this, I hate these kids. And all of a sudden, the ordinary became extraordinary when the person changed. The place didn't change. The person changed. And now all of a sudden, he said, this is amazing. This place is amazing. This place that's full of dirt and death and nothing is amazing. Why? Because God is in this place. You want to know how to change? You need to acknowledge God is in this place. You want to know what that feeling is when you walk in after all the wrong turns you did all last week, all last month, all your life? That's the pull of God saying, I got a dream that's for your life. And if you would just wake up, and quit living for yourself. Quit being selfish. Quit walking in and saying, oh, I gotta guess we gotta go to church. We gotta check the box. You know, we gotta go up, show up. And like, what? You didn't do nothing. You didn't do nothing. You wanna experience the life that God has for you? Some juncture. You gotta take you off the throne, put God on the throne. Then you wake up in your barren desert life full of all the wrong turns that you made. And you'll say, this is amazing. The suffering that you're enduring right now, it's amazing. The loss that you've experienced, it's amazing. Because I know 
that God did not lead me out here to die. That every promise that he has made, he will fulfill. That he will complete it, he will bring it to pass. And he can even bring me back. And the place that I thought was cursed will be my inheritance. Did you think about that? That should drive you to a place of gratitude. This is your wake-up call. You walked in here today asleep. This is your wake-up call. For your family, this is your wake-up call. For your marriage, this is your wake-up call. For your parenting, this is your wake-up call. For your career, this is your wake-up call. For your involvement in church, this is your wake-up call. Don't get to heaven and say, oh, no one ever told me. I told you today, fool. I told you. I looked you straight in the eye, and I told you. It's not the place that needs to change. Almost every church, I guarantee you, it's not the place that needs to change. It's the person that needs to change. You'll wake up and say, man, that worship was amazing. That message was amazing. Getting to serve on a Sunday and just park cars in a parking lot, getting to change someone else's dirty diaper. It's amazing. It's amazing. Why? Because you get to be a part of the divine dream that God has to save the world. That's a privilege. That's a mentality that says, I get to do that. Not I have to do that. You get to do that. So you better wake up and get to work. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, help us, God. Help the Jacobs become Israel, God. Help those who are asleep to wake up. God, you are here. They are not alone. They are not alone. They are hurting, yes. Wrong turns hurt. It makes a sound. It's embarrassing. You feel like it's going to last forever. It won't. But don't make a wrong turn. Sit down in it and think that it's just going to change. There's a part that you play in this. You got to wake up. You got to acknowledge him. Then you got to become aware. Aware that right now in this moment, this place is awesome. This place is awesome because God is here. That you get to worship in just a moment. That God gets to change your heart as a result of you agreeing that he's God and you're not. Man, if you can't get happy about that, if you can't get excited about it, if that doesn't do something for you, something's wrong, something's broken. You're going to come in asleep, go back out of sleep and say, oh, that place, they just need to preach better. They need to sing different songs. It's too loud, it's too soft, it's too rock, it's too old, it's too whatever. What's your excuse today? Who are you going to blame it on today? No, you're at where you're at because you made a wrong turn. Man, let's go. Let's make it right. When we sing this song in just a moment, all you have to do is acknowledge that he is God. You worship with your whole entire being. You worship your face off. And if you can't give him that, friend, I'm gonna be frank with you. You're not ready. You're not ready. If you can't praise the name of the God that found you in the middle of the desert when you were on a pillow on your last leg, if you wanna die in your pride, I'm sorry, that's on you. But for all the ones that walked in here hurting and broken, you want it? If you want it, here it is. Would you stand and worship with us?